So today's edition of conversations on the African Town Hall online television. Uh, hello, Prof. Yeah, there are some. Yes, yeah, there are some people talking in the background, or is it a vehicle on the road or something? Let me go to. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um we'll just continue what will happen is the good thing is that we are recording and we can edit this and remove where what does not fit okay okay that's great all right, all right thank you okay good evening and welcome to today's edition of conversations on the african town hall online television my name is francis meribe and i'm your anchor for today's program being focused in life is one of the most critical elements for success. We are in a world today where being focused has eluded the rising generations of Africa, making them vulnerable to manipulations by a rogue ruling class. The Town Hall Communication Company was established to give voice to the rising generations of Africa through our different programs and projects, including the Project 30 Before 30 International, through which we coach and mentor the rising generations of Africa in personal development and personal empowerment, where they thereby learn and gain capacity to midwife the expected African Renaissance. We also set up the African Town Hall Ebook Club to enable the rising generations of Africa access books easily to read at the tip of their finger from their mobile and all kinds of devices and also we have the program conversations on the african town Hall online television through which we invite inspiring people to talk about their hustle and to talk about the challenges of their life so that they will become a source of inspiration to the rising generations of Africa. We are pleased to have Professor Edmond Sanganyado all the way from China as our guest today on Conversations. Professor Edmond, welcome to our studios. Uh, it's great to have, thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, viewers, we invite you to participate in this program by asking questions, by making comments, and following up with this program so that you can learn from the thoughts that will be shared in the great story of the life of uh, Professor Edward Sanganyado. Professor Sanganyado is an associate professor at Shantou University, Guangdong, China. He holds a PhD in environmental toxicology from the University of California, Riverside, and a BSc in applied chemistry from the National University of Science and Technology, Zimbabwe. He's a recipient of the Fulbright Fellowship, the Zhujiang Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the Shantou University Outstanding Young Talent Award. His research focuses on the fate, transport, and toxicity of chemical pollutants in aquatic environments. He has published more than 30 scientific articles in journals such as Water Research, Chemical Engineering Journal, and Critical Reviews in Environmental Science and Technology. Edmond is an associate editor for the Frontiers in 
in water, academic editor for Plus One, and an editorial board member for BMC Chemistry, Communications, Earth and Environment, and Integrated Environmental Assessment and Management. He was recently elected as the president of Zimbabwe Young Academy of Sciences. Edmond, you are welcome to this show today. We are looking forward to so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Well, your story, which I picked up from LinkedIn, is so awe-inspiring. And is the genesis of this interview today, which reads as follows. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. My dad was a soldier and a full-time hustler. I had everything I needed, at least for the first eight years of my life. It all came, came crashing down in 1994. My dad died. My mom took, took reins. At least she tried. I walked hours to a school in the village until mom bought a two-roomed house in a small town called Karoi. My mom sent me to the best school she could afford. It did not last long. She died when I was preparing for my Form 4 exams. I did my A level. My young brothers and I scrounged through our neighbors' trash looking for soup, lotion, or anything. I went to university. The government stopped paying tuition. My cousin and a pastor paid for a second year. Final year, I worked two jobs. I tried doing my Master of Philosophy and quit after 18 months. A year later, I got a Fulbright Fellowship for PhD in the US, but I failed to get a job in the US and went back to Zimbabwe. I worked for five months and left for a postdoctoral in China. At 34, I was appointed an associate professor. My parents were not there to share my excitement but my wife and kids did. Join me today to celebrate my birthday. It has been a long journey to 36. God's grace will, will never take us where it can't keep us. What a story, Edmond. Thank you, thank you. And happy birthday in areas. <laughs> oh, thank you. I receive. Thank you. Okay. Now, when I look at this story, the first question um, that I feel inspired to ask you is, how could you brace up so great storms of life to achieve your dreams of becoming an authority in your field? I think uh, the pivotal moment in my life was when my mom bought that two-roomed house in Karoi. Uh, the, that two roomed house has become kind of like a metaphor of my of my life today. And I know, uh, I remember uh, there were some, you know, in, Car in Karo it rains a lot, there were crazy storms, but the walls and the roof of that small house, they protected us. I think uh, in my life I had those walls and that roof that was kind of protect me to weather the storm as the, is this, is this storm came. For example, I had friends and total strangers who like who gave me that protection that I desperately needed. For example, in 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 when I was second year as an undergraduate student, one of my friends, Fusa, he paid for my transport for the whole semester. He was not working, he was just hustling, doing it. I think I was selling fuel or something, and he paid for the whole year for the whole semester. So I had this kind of anecdotes throughout my life, scattered all over my life, where people just showed up and ushered me to the next stage. And yeah, I think that was kind of like how I can say I went that storm. It was the strangers who became family who were surrounding me. Oh, wow. Oh. That, that is awesome. That is awesome. And um, one of the things that runs clear in that kind of situation is that um, to get this kind of uh, benefit from strangers, one needs to be focused, I expect, looking towards something. Now, 
the the storms of life, even the ordinary rainstorm, distracts our attention, left, right, and center. Um, <laughs> how were you able to deal with being a young man, fettered with so much, but then you kept on, in spite of the fact that you could barely afford to do it? Uh, like I, I'll point back to to my friends. <laughs> I I think the great the script that I gave was, my, you know, we, we, we used to sit down and write goals. Imagine, like, we're talking of kids who are 14-year-olds, 15-year-old kids. We are clueless about life. On, the only thing that we, were, we knew was the things that we wanted. So we'll sit down, you know, and tell ourselves, by the end of this year, we're going to be finishing the syllabus for this course. So these small goals that we used to keep for ourselves, like, we want to finish reading this uh, novel. We want to finish reading this book. They kept us going. It's like one small goal at a time. And after like these past 30 years or so, you can, I, I look back and get surprised. Oh, wow. Those small goals were actually big goals that I could never even imagine. Oh, that, that's interesting. That is interesting. And, uh, you know, from my own experience in life, nothing is more directional. Nothing helps people to become focused than goals. Goals is a key factor to being focused. Thank you for sharing those. Now, what, what life philosophies, maybe say, or principles and values sustained your efforts and helped you to stay focused in spite of the daunting challenges before you? Uh, we, we believe that uh, one needs a, a, the right type of philosophy of life and the uh, right type of values in life to keep moving. So what were yours? Uh, I, I think my greatest influence was watching my mother making decisions. That is kind of like, she didn't have an education that was admirable. She didn't graduate from high school. She didn't go to college, nothing. But just watching how she made her decisions was like, what I can say was the greatest lesson that I ever had. I remember when I was 10 years old, she sat the whole family together and asked us and told us one thing, you know, she said, you know what? I think we should build two rooms to extend this two room house so that we can have four rooms. And because if we have four rooms, that means there will be bedrooms for you guys instead of sleeping in the, in the kitchen, right? And, but there was one, one caveat. She said, but for us to build these two new rooms, we need to sacrifice eating chicken or beef for dinner. We need to sacrifice, we are all going to eat vegetables and cabbages only. And she asked us, you choose, what do you want? Eating good, good delicious dinner or two rooms in the future and with our little minds we all agreed that you know what sleeping on your own bed will be wonderful so since then there's that has been my mantra like sacrifice today's wants for tomorrow's needs like in everything that i do i just ask myself how can i sacrifice my today's wants for my tomorrow's needs so that is kind of been my my core, my 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 philosophy in life. Oh, awesome! And and that that is to that is a very admirable standard to keep, because sometimes uh, one of the things that scuttles success in life is um, not being able to manage the the our emotional desires and the real desires of our lives. Uh, very interesting, very interesting. Okay, so. Now, the, you must have heard this saying, because it's, it's common and it's everywhere, um, leaders are leaders. A leader today is a leader tomorrow. And uh, I think the great Napoleon Bonaparte of good history, of uh, time-honored history says, show me a family that reads, and I'll show you a family that controls the world. Uh, I heard you mention while we are discussing earlier how, as young people, you made decisions on how many books you finish, how many novels you finish, so that feels good there. So what's your take on these sayings? Uh, I, 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 one thing that I, I, I want to point out was, you know, 
I have encountered, you know, ferocious readers, like people who read a book in two days, the book a day. But there was one thing that I noticed that reading is important. It's going to change how you, 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 you see the world. Your worldview can be changed by books, right? But there is one thing that I, 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 I realized that, yes, reading is good, but what you are reading and who you are reading determines whether you are going to be a good leader or emphasize good. Because just reading only will just expose you to ideas. But how are you reading? Are you like really a critical reader who doesn't accept everything on face value, questions every word that he reads so that he can create his own uh, views that are just, not just borrowed from somewhere, but they are, that are independent. I think leaders, we have developed that uh, skill to, to, to when they read, they, they, they critique what they read and harvest what is necessary from that inform from that piece of writing and discard what can be detrimental to their leadership. So I think what is what really determines whether one is going to be a reader is what you read, how you read, and who you are reading. I think th this is a great one. I've not looked at this part of it before, who you are reading. I know that what you are reading is important, but I'm glad to learn today that who you are reading is also very important. Yes, because if you are reading um, someone who cannot improve your own life, then that becomes a problem. Uh, th this is very serious. And thank you for that great uh, contribution there on this critical subject matter. Okay. So um, the next question I want to ask you here is, what books have you read in the past that impacted your life positively? What impact do, did those books have in your life? And what books are you reading now? Wow, that's it. <laughs> uh, uh, when, when I read this question, like <laughs> I sometimes ask people around me, like I always talk about the books that I read, then I ask, uh, what do you think is my favorite book? Like, what's the book that is greatest impact on me? People are like, you know what, Edmund, you change with time. You are oh. one book, there is a book that is hot one day. So I'll, I'll just pick uh, one of my, it's one of the many favorite books. There is a book by a South African called uh, Mposech. Her name is Sandra Broad. Mposech is just a, a simple uh, story. A, a boy who, is, who grew up like a, as an orphan. It resonated with me uh, because I read it when I was just a little, just getting into high school, just a little boy, and all the, 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 the suffering that was going on. So the book resonated with me a lot because it just showed me that there is a bigger world outside Karoi, like my small town. There was a bigger world out there, and hope was possible. So those are one of the books that really impacted me at an early life. Then the other book which impacted me was, uh, for funny reasons, was called Fear Nothing by Dan Coons. Uh, the book scared me. I remember reading it. I was in Form 2. That means I was around 14. Uh, I was in Form 3 at 15. I read the book. It was a very thick novel. And... The book was scary. It was talking about restless monkeys which were haunting this little boy. So I remember whilst reading the book, it was around midnight. I would stand up, check under the bed whether there were restless monkeys there. Oh, oh boy. That's how scary <laughs> the book was. But one takeaway that I did from the book, which is funny enough, which was not even the main story, was the, la the laboratories the research laboratories because the the, the 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 star of the book this is this research laboratory doing its investigation so i was so fascinated like i want to be walking around in a research laboratory it captured me like i i, I don't know what attracted me but it stayed with me i i guess that's why i'm working in a research laboratory right now Oh, that that is that has been impactful for sure. That must have yeah. been very impactful. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So the book that I'm currently reading, there is a book, you know, it's by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I think he's from Mexico. It's called Loving the Time of Cholera. 
So <laughs> I picked the book because it resonated with me at the time I started reading it sometime last year when the coronavirus started and my wife was not around. So I was just like, okay, let me read about life in the time of coronavirus or something. So I picked this book. <laughs> Oh, great, great, great. And um, one of the reasons we bring these things forward is to help the rising generations of Africa to know how the mind of those who are focused and who are moving forward, how it works and what is influencing them. Hopefully, as they share from this, uh, they themselves will learn and um, grow. Uh, we'll take a mini commercial break. When we return, we'll be learning from our guests about the negative narrative that if you want to hide something from an African, you put it inside a book. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Okay, so how concerned and embarrassed are you about that narrative that if you want to hide something from an African, put it inside a book, since Africans don't read? Is that assertion still true today? And what can we do as Africans about it? Uh, I don't know about other parts of Africa, but in Zimbabwe, I believe young people are really changing that narrative. And the way they are changing the narrative is quite interesting is they are actually publishing their own books. And uh, when, like, for example, I remember I was reading from NPR. Uh, it's a it's a red, national uh, public, public radio, radio from the US, mm -hmm. right? And reading the NPR, there was a book review and the author was a Zimbabwean. Uh, Rutendo Tavengere, I didn't know her. And I was embarrassed because I pride myself as someone who is like really up to date with all the upcoming young authors from Zimbabwe. And I didn't know her. And that book was one year old. Mm. So that's when I realized, wow. So that means Zimbabweans are publishing more and more books and not just Zimbabwe, but young people. So that really showed me that young people are, are finding ways to get their voice heard. And it is kind of like, when you look at the, at the backdrop of how young people are publishing their books, is, uh, we have a dying um, mainstream publishing industry in Zimbabwe. So there were, I think there were three major publishers. There was uh, Zimbabwe Pub uh, Publishing House, Mambo Press, and another one called Weaver Press, which was independent. Now, these were the major publishers. If you wanted to write, if you wrote a novel, if you wrote a nonfiction, you will go to this major publishing house. But the two government uh, supported publishing house, most of them, they, I can just say, they are nearly collapsed right now. So what has happened is there's now independent publishers. They are publishing more books. Young people are getting their voice heard. And it's quite fascinating when you sit down and people uh, will be talking about a book uh, that was written by their fellow Zimbabweans. So this is what is happening right now. However, one thing that I've noticed is uh, and then there is a need from the authors and publishers as well to reimagine book reading 
like we know that the the published work is going out there yeah more young people are publishing books more young people are engaging in 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 in, in, in reading but it's not being translated to a sizable readership right you'll notice that if if you get into public transport uh only one person will be holding a book reading or even reading a book from their phone and the rest will be on social media facebook whatsapp or whatever right so how can we change uh the reading culture like from the traditional print books to a new platform where young people will not hesitate in engaging i think there is that need for uh re-engagement for example uh this uh linked in post which was kind of a condensed memoir right of my of my life right it reached uh i think today there are 92 92 to 000 people have read that post mm. however if you compare to my uh physical book the memoir right it has been read by i think 200 people right but the memoir is has been around for i think it's now two years so you can see how the engagement is different between the different platforms so i think publishers need to rethink uh book reading what does it look like in the 21st century uh, that that is a great point there that's a very great point and um i look forward to publishers really taking this and running away with it and even the the, the authors themselves so they can you know come together and put out that energy there so that people will read more what they are writing and then improve themselves a lot better. That, that is very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, what were your dreams growing up? And how much did your dreams influence or propel you to achieve the success you have today? Wow. That's a <laughs> powerful question. Uh, I remember my earliest dream i think i was in second grade or third grade i still remember it uh one of my brothers uh my relatives brought a magazine and in this magazine there was a picture of a woman sitting in front of a computer and i thought uh, this device was cool then the cap caption on that uh, picture was saying she was a computer operator i wanted to be like here yeah, you know just to sit on this cool device I, I thought that was my dream job then when i grew up when i was i think in high school i i read from a newspaper article that there was less than 10 uh, heart surgeons in africa and i was like okay that's my next job i want to be a heart surgeon then i i bumped into physics then i came across that there was something called nuclear physics i thought it sounded cool you know nuclear physicist and I thought this is dangerous and sounds important. I want to be a nuclear physicist. So you can see like from there that I, I was just, I was kind of attracted to something that is unique and important, right? That I was just drawn to those things that are unique, but important at the same time. But growing up, I always had a soft spot for the environment. I was fascinated by how just simply planting trees close to the to farms like wood could stop soil erosion. And I, I filled with this anger when I saw like people causing bushfires or something like that, or dumping rubbish on the by the roadsides. I just felt like this anger. Why are people doing this? So I think I guess environmental chemistry was beckoning bacon, me from an early stage that <laughs> this is kind of my area. Let's mm -hmm. focus on the environment and do something about it. Okay, great. And and the point there is that uh, growing up, we we need to have these dreams pushing and burning at us. Um, and dreams are supposed to be be changing to goals. And then these goals should be changed as many times as possible as part of your efforts in achieving them. And uh, as you expose yourself to more, either your dreams acquire a new title, a new life, or get wings to fly. So I think all of that suited well with you. Which kind of goes with what we want to do from Africa Town Hall Online Television to help the rising generations of Af Africa to keep dreaming, That's to true. keep never to stop dreaming. That is one of the things we want to emphasize. Wow, and uh, you, your life and your own dreams growing up has helped to show that that is the way to go. You, you have been on the tab all the time, you know. 
coming up with different ideas. So thank you. Thank you very much for those insights. Okay. Um, at the African Town Hall Online Television, we believe that failure is part of success. We know that nobody actually becomes successful who have not failed on something before. We know that mistakes and failures are for those who are actively doing something and that only such have a chance for success in life. So can you take a moment to talk about some times when you have failed or made costly mistakes and how you were able to bounce back and still attain the success you were pursuing? I think you hinted some of those, but it would be nice to recap that a little bit so people can know for sure. Uh, the one that, that comes to my mind immediately was when, on my first job, just out, out of high school. I got a job as a grocery store uh, attendant. On the first day of my first job, I broke a crate which was full of eggs. I don't know what I was doing. I was jittery. Then walking to the shop floor, I dropped the eggs and they all splattered on the floor. And... What if my floor manager came and he just said, welcome to town and country. And he started laughing. And that uh, light moment on this disastrous first day helped me to realize that, you know what? Sometimes when you make those costly mistakes, you just need to sit back and realize, you know what? I'm here. That means I'm, I, I did something. I got the job, you know. Uh, it, it helped me to, to, to get a lighter side of of the mistakes. However, there are sometimes, uh, I remember between 2015 and 2016, I sent more than 400 job applications across the globe. And out of those 400, I was called to only two interviews, one in Zimbabwe and one in Switzerland. Uh, the one in Switzerland, I went there, they paid for my air ticket, everything. Then after two weeks, I received a letter of regret. I was devastated. Then in Zimbabwe, I was offered that position. However, it was for a lecturer. But I looked at uh, the how career progression at that university, and I realized that I wasn't going to progress from lecturer to anything else in any time soon. So I decided to leave the faculty position and took a, a step down on the career ladder and took a job as a postdoc in China. And after two and a half years, I was offered the position as an associate uh, professor here. So I ended up climbing three runs up again from my earlier one step down. That That is interesting. Very interesting. And um, I hope that our viewers are taking note of the fact that it, it, the journey, the whole thing is a journey. A lot of things will keep happening. And as you keep dealing with them, moving forward that's the spirit thank you very much for uh sharing those thoughts so that we know that um, mistakes are part of the game failure is part of the game what must continue is effort this is highly appreciated thank you well viewers you are still watching conversations on the african town hall online television with professor edmond sanganyado of shanto university guandong china Join us by asking questions and making comments on the discussion so we can expand the scope for greater benefit for all who are involved. Okay, um, Prof. Politics and the acquisition of political power in Africa is a do or die affair. Do you have a position on the insane approach and attitude to the acquisition and use of political power in Africa these days? Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things that I've realized, right, is there is a gross misunderstanding of the role of political leaders in the government in society uh, across Africa. And it's, I, I wouldn't be worried or concerned about that gross misunderstanding if it was only the politicians who don't understand leadership and governance. Because if politicians are not understanding leadership and governance and the voters understand leadership and government, then the voters will just put the politicians out. Unfortunately, it is the voters who don't understand and sometimes opt for willful ignorance. And in democracy, politicians don't 
acquire power. They are given power by the voters. Now, the incentive in Africa will only stop when voters start asking themselves, who am I giving power and why am I giving them? And most of the times when you look in most countries in, Af in Africa is uh, politicians are given power for frivolous reasons, like, oh, he's a member of my tribe, you know, so he can, he's a good leader. And, and who am I giving power? They'll be like, ah, he's a successful businessman, so I can give him power. People don't really ask the deep questions. What is the consequence of, of what will happen if I give this person power? Do they have the voters at heart or they have their selfishness or greed or power hungerness at heart? Right. So I think one of the important things is, is for us, we just need to start asking ourselves, oh, where am I giving this power and why am I giving that? Yeah, that, that is very awesome. You know, the last time we were, uh, I convened the African Youth Conference and then uh, online, I got several young people across Africa to to come to this studio they joined me on daily basis for a whole of one month and we kept talking about uh the african leadership question problems and prospects so during that period and the young people themselves they were able to agree that yes yes these leaders these rulers we have in africa are bad they are doing all kinds of things but they also made it clear that we and then especially the young people are the most unresponsive kind of people they, they believe that if we are doing our part, you know, the leaders, they say, will feel accountability and then do what needs to be done. So probably, in fact, we, we rose from that conference feeling that we need more political education for mm -hmm. the public, not for the politicians or the rulers who are who already, you know, they know their game, they know what they're after, they go for it. But how about us? They are using the mandate that we provide. So That's thank right. you for putting this in a very pointed way that voters should begin to ask themselves that question. Who, this person you're giving power, who is, why, how? And I think it makes a lot of sense when we begin to think in those terms. Yeah, can, can I add something on, you mentioned something about yeah, yeah. accountability. Uh, yes. Like, you know, I, I used to do principal for our accounting in high school. One thing that I realized is you can only account for something that you understand. You, for example, if I tell, ask you that uh, to, to keep 10 kettle, right? I have 10 kettle and I ask you to keep it, right? Uh, the only way that someone else can come to account for my kettle is if they know what kettle look like. Because if they don't, they're going to say, ah, your kettle are now productive. When I got there, there were now 50. After they have counted, they got in the ship. So as young people, we just need to get to a place where we are educated enough about leadership and governance so that we can we can be able to demand accountability to our leaders. I think that's a that's a great point. Well made there. Um the one of the other things that came up during the that conference was, oh, yes, we realize we need to do something. But, you know, we are so hungry. They bring this money. And my question is, if you keep collecting this money from them, you are simply buying and selling. They have paid you for it. And if they gave you five naira for a plate of food right now, you've been paid for four years. Why don't you think? You know, you mentioned about delayed gratification earlier today. How about you you starve a little bit more? How about you fast a little bit longer so that yeah. tomorrow can become meaningful? So I, I think that is that's a great point you've made there. Thank you. Okay. Well, viewers, thank you for continuing to be with us on conversations on African Town Hall Online Television with uh, Professor Edmond Sanganyado from uh, Shantou University, Guangdong in China. We'll take a short uh, commercial break and when we return our guest will share his thoughts on the prospects of solving the perennial problem of leadership in africa please stay tuned
Hello, everyone. We would like to introduce you to Graceworth Nigeria Limited. Graceworth Nigeria Limited is a Nigerian owned and operated company using seasoned and accomplished professionals to execute complex security missions in conjunction with the host government to mitigate risk on behalf of our clients. Our team members have decades of experience in the security sector, bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience that not all security companies are able to offer. The success of the company is based on our unrivaled ability to build and maintain successful partnerships with our customers to provide professional and reliable security services. We pride ourselves on providing highly trained personnel experienced in dealing with the most complex of security issues. Since our formation, we have gained a reputation as a highly experienced company with a young, energetic and forward-thinking management team offering the highest level of professionalism. We offer the following services. 1. Security awareness and training. 2. Program support and consultancy. 3. Risk assessment and investigations. 4. Executive protection and travel management. You can contact us on plus 234-807-227-2799 or 0702-525-4858 or visit our office at 14 Buchanan Crescent, off Amanukano Crescent, was 2, Abuya, Nigeria. We would be glad to have you. Graceworth, leave your worries with us. Okay, welcome back. Now, that Africa is bedeviled by bad leadership, we know that, and bad followership, as we have already mentioned. Um, is there any magic bullets for curing leadership failure in Africa? If there are, what options would those be? What would be those bullets? Uh, <laughs> it's quite a... I, I, I am I'm a perennial optimist. I always <laughs> like to see the bright side of everything. However, for this uh, leadership problem that we have in Africa, I think there is need for sit, sitting back and look for long-term solutions. And one of the most important thing is education for the voters that we need to be to, to educate ourselves like beyond uh slogans uh personalities you know and posters and regalia that kind of uh voter education but a uh, voter education that way by people understand what are their human rights like what are you in titles as a citizenship right uh who are you as a citizen that, that kind of education that people understand because honestly you can't choose a leader if you don't know who you are as an individual so i think that is kind of the more starting place that we need that we need to educate ourselves of who we are before we can identify who can lead us so I think it's really important, especially for the largest voting block in Africa is young people, right? They are very vocal, we are a very vocal lot, but we need to translate our social media activism, our online activism, let's translate it to something tangible, let's translate it to ballot papers, let's move the, in those corridors of power, right? And engage with those corridors of power so that we are interested right and to do that like i said we need to sit back and understand who we are and what we want so that we can understand you know, uh, how to hold our leaders to account mm. yeah that's it takes us back to that that responsibility on the part of um, each person the rising generations especially now, yes. as you mentioned, the this demographic issue concerning the fact that the largest voting bloc in the whole of Africa is the young people. Uh, every time I think about that, um, the Nigerian Electoral uh, Register, it was said that 65% of those registered inside it are young people. And I said, that is a majority vote. All they need is coordination. and uh, But then it's not happening. 
and I can yeah. identify with your thoughts about knowing who you are and what it is you are doing when you pick that ballot paper to vote yes. for someone. And um, and I'm wondering how can we continue to do this kind of education? Do you have other uh, thoughts on how to push at that kind of education for our young people? Yes. Uh, I one thing that I noticed, like from our education, I don't. I'm not sure in Nigeria, but I, from my conversation with my Nigerian friends, I can say even in Nigeria that our education systems are structured that we become followers. They are structured in a way that we we should become followers. They are not structured to develop leaders, right? So when you have got that kind of uh, curricula, right, for 15 years, where you are being groomed to be the next follower, to be the next employee, to be the next worker, not to be the next leader, we, we get that reluctance to participate in leadership because you it's it's a new field for you. So young people, they have got this, there's this problem that, firstly, the education curriculum doesn't develop us to become leaders because it's only leaders who can choose good leaders. Then the second thing is uh, with this advent of social media and um, the internet where there is all this wonderful information uh, highway, we hear stories more of anomalies, not of reality. Well, I with that, I mean, we know of stories of people who dropped out of school who became successful, but we are not told of uh, the 80% who didn't drop out of school and yet became successful. So young people are now being pressured into the anomaly. So when you are now, when you like focus on the anomaly, the outlier, which is not a reality at all, you disengage with the reality. So there is no need for me to participate in what is happening in my country if I'm pursuing an anomaly, right? Because I have to disengage from the reality of my everyday life. So that is one thing that I have noticed that if it goes back to the curriculum that we have across Africa, where we are being developed not to be to, to be leaders but to be followers and so when we see these anomalies they are attractive to us not because they are real but because they make us break away from this fold of just becoming workers so i think it all goes back to that that as young people we just need uh, a moment for introspection and check who am i <laughs> really <laughs> Very important question. They are very important question. And I hope that uh, young people who are viewing this program will begin to ask themselves this question because that's the whole intention of coming and setting all of this up and getting Prof to, um, uh, you know, get his things tidied up and come and spend this hour with us just to make sure we can have you thinking along this very important line. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, Using your life's philosophy, values and experiences, and successes and failures as theistic, what are your final words of advice to this at this interview for the rising generations of Africa, the current political rulers and parents of youth of today? So that's uh, we want you to put words to to these three groups: the rising generations, that's the young people. The political rulers, I don't call them leaders because they don't give me that impression. And then parents who are nurturing some of these more earlier younger people are preparing them for tomorrow. Where's for them, Prof? Um, uh, this is a really important question, but I only have one word for the current political crop, the political leaders, that young people are rising, young people are coming, and young people are waking up. And if you see the number of uh, books that are young people are, read, are writing, and if you see the, the, the type of complex and challenging questions that young people are asking, you will know that they are up to something, and that something is going to change the face of Africa, maybe in five years or in 10 years, but this is really going to happen. And to parents who are raising young people, raise leaders, uh, 
teach them the tough questions that you can deny today's gratification for tomorrow's needs. It, it, the, those small lessons that you teach your kids are going to be the fortress or the foundation of who they are going to become. And if you're going to raise leaders, teach them to ask the questions because the right question when asked creates opportunities. So these are the few ways that I, I have that you ask the question, remain curious, keep asking, keep reading, and it's only the curious who are going to find the door that is going to change the way that we see things today. Wow, awesome, awesome. This is uh, very exciting to me, and uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for making time to be at this event. And viewers, please join me to express gratitude to Professor Edmond Sanyata, Sanganyadro from Sh uh, Sh Shanto University, Guangdong, China. He's an associate professor in our university. And we are so very grateful that you could share your day with us and in these important thoughts. So thank you very much, Prof. We appreciate every bit of it. Thank Please you. keep your doors and windows open. We will keep calling on you. Um, from your voice today, we know you are interested in the development <laughs> of the African rising generation. You want them to be better. You want the best for them and you are excited about the improvements okay. in their lives. And we enjoyed, I enjoyed your optimistic uh, position in all of this. That hope to keep the uh, fire burning is highly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, viewers, you can um, help the cause of providing inspiring stories like this to more viewers by checking back on this broadcast on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn why they are like love share and comment on it and of course ask questions which we will uh, find time if you want professor uh, edmond sanganyado to answer any specific questions for you if you send it to us we'll provide it to him and he will make time and deal with those so remember way to subscribe to our youtube channel the afghan town hall and when you do hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified each time we post a new video. We are so very grateful to share this hour with you, Prof, and with you, our viewers. Thank you, and have a blessed day. Thank you.